On a hot summer night in Texas, three teenagers are hunted and slaughtered. The killer is sentenced to die and then set free. How can this serial killer get out of prison? How could he have been on death row and make parole? He got by with murder. He could do it again. And he did. Kenneth McDuff was a killer when he went in, and he was a killer when he went out. A second wave of murders shocks the state, giving parole a bad name. It changed the criminal justice system in Texas. There's no question about it. On October 11th, 1989, after nearly 23 years in prison, a notorious killer made parole. The release of 43-year-old Kenneth Allen McDuff shocked the people of Central Texas. The general reaction was, how on earth could this man get out? This is the broomstick killer. And um, if anyone should be executed, it should be him. It had been more than two decades, but many recalled all too well the horrific crimes of Kenneth McDuff. August 6, 1966. 20-year-old Kenneth McDuff was headed to Fort Worth. McDuff had a new friend along for the ride, an 18-year-old named Roy Dale Green. Roy Dale was uh, a weakling who was not very bright and who was really impressed with Kenneth McDuff. During their night on the town, Green didn't seem bothered by the plans McDuff was making. McDuff had been talking about picking up girls and violence and he talked about rape. Roy Dale Green just never, never took it seriously. Around 10 p.m., the two men drove into the small town of Everman, south of Fort Worth. McDuff found a baseball field where three teenagers were parked in a car. 16-year-old Edna Louise Sullivan, her boyfriend, 17-year-old Robert Brand, and Robert's 15-year-old cousin, Mark Dunham. According to Roy Dale Green, McDuff stopped his car pulled out a Colt 38 revolver, got out, and walked up to the teens. Magduff took his pistol and went up and uh, ordered them out of the car and put all three of them in the trunk of their car. Green followed in Macduff's car as his new friend drove the teen sedan to an isolated area. Magduff ultimately opened the trunk, took the girl out, put her in his car, and just shot those poor boys. They begged for their lives, and he just shot them, and it was just cold-blooded murder. McDuff was impatient, and when he could not close the trunk of the teen's car with their bodies inside, he backed it up to a fence, leaving the trunk open. Then he and Green got into McDuff's car and drove away, with Louise Sullivan locked in the trunk. They drove around, finally found the proper place for him to commit his acts on this poor Louise Sullivan, and he raped her. McDuff raped the girl using an old broomstick he had in his car. Finally, he used the broomstick to kill her. Macduff laid her down on her back and, and sat, sat on her chest and took that broomstick and held it down over her throat and pressed and pressed and pressed with it until she finally gasped and died. Macduff and Green dumped Sullivan's body in some tall grass, then headed home. 
The boys' bodies were found the next day in the trunk of their car. When the news got out, Roy Dale Green broke down. Green had a conscience, and he got to feeling real bad, and he told somebody what had happened. Green led police to the body of Louise Sullivan. McDuff was quickly arrested. Green, his accomplice, was the star witness against him at his murder trial. On the stand, Green seemed terrified to be in the same room with McDuff. His voice would drop to an inaudible uh, level. The jury could tell he was telling the truth. There's no way he could be rehearsed on the way he was testifying. McDuff took the stand in his own defense. He acted like he could care less. He said he didn't kill him, uh, that it was all Green's doing, and he just had cold, cold eyes. But it's heartbreaking to sit there and listen to him when he was on the witness stand, just nonchalant, I mean, like he wasn't nothing to him, you know? The jury didn't believe the 20-year-old McDuff. In November 1966, they found him guilty. The judge sentenced him to die in the electric chair. He became known as the broomstick killer. During the six years after the murders, the condemned killer managed to win two stays of execution. Then, in 1972, he got lucky, as did everyone facing the death penalty in the U.S. the uh, Supreme Court overturned the death penalty. That meant that everyone on death row, including Kenneth McDuff's sentence, were commuted to life. Dallas investigative reporter Robert Riggs tracked attempts by McDuff and other convicts to make parole. They were eligible for parole, but who would imagine somebody would give it to them? McDuff kept at it and got lucky again. In 1987, a federal court ruled that Texas prisons were so overcrowded, they violated the civil rights of inmates. The court set limits on prison populations. As a result, county jails became overcrowded with a backlog of inmates. So a deal was quietly struck between Texas Governor Bill Clements and members of the parole board. And that pact was that in order to relieve prison overcrowding, you're going to turn loose 150 inmates a day. They went through the con artist, you know, eventually worked their way up to the car thieves, but suddenly they had run out of bodies. They found themselves in the dregs of the prison system. The parole board reached Kenneth McDuff in October 1989 and set him free. I was absolutely flabbergasted when I heard that proling man because I knew that he wasn't going to quit. I knew he wasn't going to quit. In October 1989, convicted killer Kenneth Allen McDuff was paroled. His release alarmed the people of Central Texas and law enforcement officers like brothers Mike and Parnell McNamara both deputy U.S. Marshals in Waco. When McDuff was set free, the two men were deluged with calls. We had people tell us that they had their windows barred, their doors uh, bolted shut, people uh, that had not carried guns before, carried guns. They were scared to death. After he paroled out, he returned to the Rosebud area. and. Uh, was right there in the middle of those people. Rosebud, Texas, a small town near Waco, is where Kenneth McDuff grew up. Longtime residents Wanda Fisher and Glenn Stock still remember the young bully who became the broomstick killer. He was a loner. If Kenneth could push you or knew he could push you, He'll push you to the limits. But if you knew he couldn't get by with nothing, he wouldn't mess with you. 
Young Kenneth Macduff apparently was most influenced by his domineering mother, Eddie, known around town as the pistol-packing mama. Mrs. Macduff carried the reputation of being a bad person. She did carry a gun. That was always said that she always had a gun with her in her purse. At home, Addie Macduff lavished praise on her son and, by all accounts, protected him, even when he got in trouble. By his late teens, Macduff had been arrested and served time for a number of burglaries, a rap sheet he dismissed as trivial in an interview years later with author Gary Laverne. When I spoke to Kenneth about this string of burglaries that uh, took place when he was around 18 or 19 years old, he just laughed and he said, oh, they was just pranks. By 1966, those pranks had escalated to a triple homicide. When Macduff was paroled in 1989, Few Rosebud residents believed he was reformed. No one wanted Kenneth Macduff to come back to Rosebud. We knew that he would be trouble. As expected in July 1990, there was trouble. Macduff was a rabid racist. One evening in Rosebud, while he's on Main Street, some young black kids were walking by and he called them names and racial slurs and pulled a knife out on them, which should have sent him back to prison forever. Macduff was sent back to prison for the threat, but because of the chronic overcrowding problem in Texas, he was out on the streets after only a few months. It made no difference if you violated your parole, uh, if you violated probation, anything, or if you really committed a serious crime, you weren't going to do much time. Following his re-release, Macduff appeared ready to make a change. In early 1991, he enrolled at Texas State Technical College in Waco and got a job. According to Macduff, he wanted to make money legitimately. At least that's what he told me when I interviewed him. And that took the form of getting a job as a cashier at a convenience store called the Quick Pack. Macduff quit after a month. By the summer of 1991, he was back to his old ways, hanging around a part of Waco called The Cut. It's best known for its CD bars, drug dealers, and prostitutes. He used, bought, and sold drugs and engaged in behavior that should have sent him back to prison because they were violations of his parole. But his overworked parole officer did not send him back to prison. Kenneth Macduff slipped through the cracks. Left unsupervised, Macduff demonstrated a monstrous appetite for beer, crack cocaine, and violent sex. Macduff was a sexual sadist. He got his thrills from causing pain and causing terror. Women were less than, than human uh, to him. Uh, they were something to be used and used up, as he said. He was very brutal to him. Uh, and the ones that did get away from him literally escaped with their life because uh, a lot of them didn't. One who didn't was a prostitute named Brenda Thompson. Macduff was stopped at a routine roadblock late one night in October 1991. When an officer approached his pickup truck, he saw a woman screaming and kicking the windshield as if she was trying to escape. To the officer, it looked like her hands were bound. Macduff crashed through the roadblock. They did give chase, and um, but he was able to get away at that time, and that's the last time that Brenda Thompson was seen. Just days later, another prostitute named Regina Moore vanished from the streets. She was last seen in the car with Kenneth Macduff. So that was two people right there that had just vanished that were last seen in his company. Yet the Waco police did not pursue Macduff. 
they really never, from what I understand, fully checked him out. So he was always uh, in the grasp of police who, through really lousy police work, always let him go on to another victim. Sunday, December 29th, 1991. Macduff was on the move again, this time headed south to Austin in a tan Thunderbird. At his side was a new friend, Alva Hank Worley. Also out that night was a 28-year-old Austin woman named Colleen Reed. Colleen Reed was a, a lovely, bright accountant, uh, a woman who was beloved in her office in Austin, many, many friends. That afternoon, Colleen didn't feel well. She took a long nap and woke up in the early evening. She woke up and realized that she still had to go deposit some money at the ATM. Her car was filthy. She went to the bank. She went to the local supermarket, and then she went to wash her car. And little does she know that Kenneth McDuff and his accomplice are circling this car wash like a shark circling its prey. They slide in behind her. McDuff slips out of his car, grabs her by the throat. He's an enormous man, enormous hands. She's a very small, petite woman. You know, literally lifts her by one hand by her throat, shoves her into the car. People standing on the front porch of a nearby house heard a woman screaming. They heard the screams and immediately went over to the car wash where they found Colleen's car still dripping with suds, still wet. No one's there. She was gone. Poof, gone. The witnesses told police they saw a tan Thunderbird speed away from the car wash. The wrong way, down a one-way street. Three months later, 23-year-old Melissa Ann Northrup, a pregnant mother of two, was working the night shift at the Waco Quick Pack, the same convenience store where McDuff once worked. Northrup had complained to her boss that she didn't feel safe working alone in the store at night. She said, I'm afraid to fill the, the beer boxes up because I can't hear when someone comes in and out the front door because there was no security period and MacDuff knew that he told a number of friends that there was a good-looking girl in a convenience store that he could rob without a problem on the night of March 1st 1992 Kenneth MacDuff was out looking for drugs then his car broke down and guess where it broke down about 100 to 200 yards from the quick pack store where Melissa Northrup was working the graveyard shift. Melissa Northrup had spoken to her husband Aaron on the phone several times that night, but when he called around 4 a.m., there was no answer. He got worried and rushed to the store. I got the call and it was Aaron. He said, Brenda, is Melissa there? And I said, well, no. He said, is her car there? And I said, well, no, she's at work. He said, she's not at work. I'm here at her work, and she's not here, and she's gone, and her car's gone. We feel that she may have very well been kidnapped. Okay. Any leads, any suspects, anything to go on? We have no suspects at this time, at this point. She's gone. And then a few days later, Kenneth McDuff's car was discovered at the New Road Inn, which is just about a block from the Quick Pack. And uh, he was also missing. He was gone from the area. The discovery of McDuff's tan Thunderbird near the convenience store, coupled with what the marshals knew about his violent past, would soon make him the prime suspect in the disappearance of four women. And from that moment on, uh, a massive manhood took place, and the hunt for McDuff was on. In March 1992, 
A manhunt began in central Texas for Kenneth McDuff, a convicted killer who had been sent to death row and then paroled. An overcrowded prison system led to his release, along with other violent criminals. McDuff was the tip of the iceberg. There were hundreds and hundreds of Kenneth McDuffs released onto the streets of the state. But McDuff, the notorious broomstick killer, was one of the worst. Now he was suspected in the disappearance of 23-year-old Melissa Ann Northrup. In March 1992, she vanished from her job at a convenience store in Waco. We didn't have a clue where she was at or whether she'd turn up or anywhere, but she was reported missing from the store. As a missing persons case, jurisdiction fell to local authorities. The Texas Marshals and federal prosecutors convinced that McDuff was responsible for the disappearance, wanted badly to get on the case, but they couldn't unless there was a federal charge. We knew he was on the prowl, and we did feel a commitment to get him off the street as soon as we could. We just felt this urgent, immediate urgency. What are we going to do about it? Federal prosecutors. Bill Johnston did some digging and found an informant willing to say that McDuff sold him some LSD, a federal offense. For one tab of LSD, which is all we had to work with, I wrote an affidavit right then and the magistrate issued the warrant and the chase was on. A chase that now brought the weight of the federal government into the hunt for Kenneth McDuff. We searched all the area uh, around the TSTC campus uh, where McDuff had been going to school. We searched the fields and uh, followed up all the leads we could. There was a, a big effort on the part of many agencies in this area to try to find Melissa. Melissa Ann Northrup was no longer the only woman missing. Authorities learned that there were three other disappearances for which McDuff was allegedly responsible. Two prostitutes from the Waco area and a fourth woman, Colleen Reed, abducted from a car wash in Austin. Investigators decided to search McDuff's parents' home near the small town of Belton, Texas. They questioned McDuff's father about where his son might be. He said... Uh, I don't know where he is, says if you find him, you can kill him if you want to. And that was the beginning of six weeks of bizarre things. For those six bizarre weeks, investigators sought out anyone who might have known McDuff. We got the same story from almost all the people that we uh, interviewed that uh, he had continuously talked about murdering people, burying people, disposing of bodies. Then they found Alva Hank Worley, a high school dropout, small-time crook, and occasional drinking buddy of Macduff. Worley lived at Bloom's Motel off Interstate 35 in Belton. He seemed suspicious from the start. What was most apparent in our interview with Worley was his lack of feeling at all. It was certainly a signal to us that, that he knew far more than what he was telling us. For several weeks, authorities kept showing up at Worley's rundown motel room. In April, a Bell County investigator found that Worley wouldn't sit still or look him in the eye. I would grab him by the shoulders and tell him, Hank, you, you need to talk to me about this situation. And that was the first time that he said, uh, uh, I, 
I think, uh, I think he might have hurt somebody. A few days later, Worley was ready to talk about his friend, whom he called Mac. He got word to investigator Tim Steglick to meet him at the motel. Hank walked up to the passenger side door of the car, and he opened the door, and he looked at me, and he said, I was with Mac when he took that girl from the car wash. That girl was Colleen Reed, who had been missing for four months. Alva Hank Worley's confession was a terrible story of abduction, torture, and murder. You had talked about uh, abducting her from the car wash and then driving her to south of Belton. He was saying that uh, she was raped and tortured in the car. Her hands were bound behind her back. They repeatedly raped her in every way that you can rape another human being. They burned her with cigarettes, um, beat on her. Um, she took a lot of torture. She took a lot of abuse. Worley showed investigators an abandoned road near the McDuff family home where Reed was taken and tortured some more. It was a gravel road uh, in the middle of a field. It was a very spooky place. At one point, Worley put his hands over his ears and looked down as he was standing in the middle of this field and said, her screams are so loud, they're hurting my ears. It was almost like he was still hearing her scream. Worley said he watched in horror as McDuff beat Colleen Reed until she was lifeless. Just days before Worley's confession, another murder had been attributed to Kenneth McDuff. On March 25, 1992, behind the campus of Texas State Technical College, a young man made a grisly discovery. He saw something, and unfortunately it was a part of the body that had protruded above the ground. Investigators who thought they knew all about McDuff's alleged victims were in for a shock. We thought, well, it's Melissa Northrup. And then as they got down closer, they saw the hair, and the hair was uh, not of a white person. So everybody was going, my gosh, who is this? It was 22-year-old Valencia K. Joshua, a prostitute from Waco. Authorities learned she was last seen at the college campus looking for Kenneth McDuff. Was convicted in April, the U.S. Marshal's Office made a public appeal to be on the lookout for McDuff. He's a very dangerous man, and we want him off the streets, and that's why we're asking for your help to help us. The manhunt now included dozens of local, state, and federal officers, all working around the clock. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nobody went home. People were slept in the halls. I mean, it was very, it was the most intense manhunt uh, that uh, I've ever been involved in. On April 26, 1992, in rural Dallas County, the search for Melissa Northrup came to an end. A fisherman discovered her badly decomposed body floating in about four feet of water. For Melissa's family, 57 days of waiting were over. But her mother still had to give Melissa's two children the news. The most difficult thing I had to do was sit down with these two kids. and tell them their mother wasn't ever coming home. With no breaks in the case, the U.S. Marshals decided it was time for a new strategy. They approached the producers of the program America's Most Wanted, which aired a segment about Kenneth McDuff. The May 1992 broadcast generated numerous tips, one from a man in Kansas City, Missouri, man said he recognized McDuff as someone he worked with at a trash company named Richard Fowler. A quick check revealed that Richard Fowler was really Kenneth McDuff. 
On May 4th, 1992, McDuff was arrested and flown back to Waco, Texas. We just couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe that he was actually in custody. Everyone that uh, was working on the case was, you know, just elated that this man was finally off the street. Back in Waco, the marshals had to contend with an angry crowd that gathered outside the federal courthouse to vent their rage at McDuff. Suddenly, the extended family members of Melissa Northrup exploded in anger and began Mama. screaming and sobbing and crying at him. Your vengeance is mine, save the Lord! He's gonna get you! The marshals who had worked so hard to capture McDuff now found themselves concerned for the killer's safety, protecting him in order to bring him to justice. These were not murders of opportunity. It wasn't like he just snapped and went out and murdered. He actually pre-planned and, uh, and, and determined to find a victim. Out of the five suspected victims, Prosecutors felt their strongest evidence involved the abduction and murder of Melissa Northrup. The state would try that case first. A bearded McDuff appeared in court in July 1992 for arraignment on capital murder charges. Because of heavy publicity, McDuff's court-appointed attorney requested and received a change of venue. In February 1993, the Houston courthouse became the setting for McDuff's second capital murder trial. The evidence is going to show you in this case that there were only two people who were the witnesses to the death of Melissa Ann Northrup. One being Melissa Ann Northrup and the second was Kenneth Allen McDuff. So it is a circumstantial case. During testimony, cameras were allowed to record only pictures and no sound. One of the first witnesses for the prosecution was Kenneth McDuff's mother, Addie, now 77 years old and in frail health. She had been subpoenaed to testify as a hostile witness. She confirmed that her son used her credit card. Receipts showed McDuff was in the Waco area the night of the abduction. McDuff objected to his mother being called to take the stand against him. I didn't personally want her to come because of her health, but the district attorney insisted on it. In court, McDuff became agitated when two former friends testified that he used drugs and once tried to talk them into robbing the convenience store where Northrop worked. Kenneth is, is, is firmly convinced, and, and as are we, that these people are not telling the truth. Uh, and it's hard to listen to. McDuff began to get impatient, even with his own lawyers. One time during the trial, he threw a pencil across the room and said, why don't you sit on the prosecutor's side? You're helping them more than you are me. And I had conversation after conversation with Kenneth about, look, you know, you got to keep your cool. But McDuff complained to reporters that his attorneys weren't following his orders. My attorneys won't ask the questions I requested from mass or the witnesses. What are they doing wrong? Well, they just, they just uh, go through the motions. McDuff soon had more reason to be upset when the judge allowed the testimony of Alva Hank Worley, his confessed accomplice in the murder of Colleen Reed a crime for which he had not yet been tried. I think it's going to be very inflammatory and not give me a fair trial in the present case. The prosecution argued that Worley's testimony would establish a pattern of conduct, showing McDuff murdered Reed would help prove he murdered Northrop. It's called signature crimes to show the similarities, to show that this was McDuff's signature, the way he committed his murders. Prosecutors said there were many similarities between the two crimes, including the way the two victims looked, and that shoelaces had been used to tie up both women. In February 1993, a nervous Alva Hank Worley arrived at the courthouse. 
No, I don't. I'm scared to death that fella. Why are you so scared? I'm scared of him. Woolley's testimony about the murder of Colleen Reed would not turn out to be the worst problem for the defense. That came when Kenneth McDuff insisted on taking the stand. I spent days, literally, trying to get him not to testify. Under the rules of evidence, if he did not testify, then his back past criminal convictions for the three murders in 66 wouldn't have come into the courtroom. McDuff ignored his lawyer's advice and took the stand. For two hours, he spun a rambling tale. It was just a fairy tale that he tried to explain everything away, that he'd gone to uh, San Antonio and he got a truck driver to haul him somewhere and he got off in Kansas and he got a train. You know, it was just stupid. During McDuff's testimony, prosecutors brought up the brutal broomstick killings, describing McDuff as a murderer by occupation. It took jurors only four hours to reach a decision. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kenneth Allen McDuff, guilty of capital murder, as charged in the indictment. During the sentencing phase, the prosecution said there was only one appropriate punishment. I can look Kenneth McDuff in the eye and say, you deserve the death penalty for your heartless, brutal, soulless acts. The defense requested life in prison for the ex-con. Mr. McDuff knows how to do time. He functions well in a highly structured environment. It took the jury about an hour to decide his fate. McDuff showed no emotion as he heard the judge read the sentence. I assess your punishment at death by lethal injection. McDuff maintained his innocence as he was led from court. I'm so sorry about what happened, but I wasn't the one who did it. A year later, in 1994, McDuff received a second death sentence for the murder of Colleen Reed, even though her body had not been found. Following the verdict, Melissa Northrup's mother, Brenda Solomon, hugged Colleen's sister, Lori Bible. McDuff could not control himself as he was led from the courtroom. Settle down, fella. This ain't necessary to be hanging on to. By 1994, Kenneth Allen McDuff had received two death sentences for the murders of Colleen Reed and Melissa Ann Northrup. McDuff is the only man in Texas history ever sent to death row, paroled, and then sent back for killing again. It had been seven years since Regina Moore, Brenda Thompson, and Colleen Reed disappeared. Their bodies had not been found. In a 1998 interview, McDuff was still denying involvement in any murder. Tell them where Colleen Reed is. They still haven't found her body. Kind of, I mean, is there any way to make amends? Um, first of all, I would have to know where it was at. Did you ever kill anybody? No. Not even those kids back in 1966? No. I don't want to see anyone suffer or die. Uh, there's so many uh, rights and wrongs, you know, in the world that you know, it's whose point of view what is right and what's wrong. Some would say you're the poster child for what is wrong. And uh, are you sure talking to me bad? <laughs> As McDuff's execution day drew near, an informant close to the killer offered to try to get him to talk about the locations of the bodies. Eventually, the informant came back and said, he told me, he told me where, 
where one was for sure and gave me a good idea on another one. Kenneth McDuff's directions proved accurate. Regina Moore was found next to a bridge off the side of a highway. In late September 1998, investigators videotaped the recovery of her skeletal remains. Moore's hands had been tied behind her back with shoelaces. Her ankles were bound with stockings. It looks like it's wound around both of them and back around the back of them. But you can only imagine what her last minutes or moments on this earth were like at the hands of Kenneth McDuff. McDuff also revealed where he buried Brenda Thompson. Assistant U.S. Attorney Bill Johnston followed McDuff's directions to a heavily wooded area just outside Waco. I just chose to dig in one little place. About a foot down, I hit something hard and got down on my hands and knees and it was a, it was a bone. Brenda Thompson was buried about a foot deep, lying face down. One woman was still missing, Colleen Reed. She was the one McDuff wouldn't give up. In fact, McDuff said to the informant, if I give them Colleen Reed, they won't need me anymore. He said, they'll take away my commissary. They won't treat me right. This is a guy who's going to be executed in two weeks. I mean, it's preposterous anyway, but that's the way he thought. A meeting with officials was arranged. They assured McDuff that he wouldn't lose prison privileges, and he began talking. He began telling us with great detail how to find Colleen Reed. It was where he had grown up, near the Brazos River. Investigators searched for hours with heavy digging machinery, but still found nothing. That afternoon, desperate officials secretly arranged to bring McDuff to the site. It was a high security, clandestine move uh, off a of death row with several investigators and a couple of different vehicles. Although the terrain had changed, McDuff pointed the search team in the right direction. He knew immediately. He said, tell them to move one blade length. They moved up one blade length and the next thing she was found. So, I mean, he knew within a few feet. The remains of Colleen Reed were removed from the ground, seven years after she was abducted from a car wash in Austin. Back on death row in Huntsville, prison investigator John Moriarty spent more than 40 hours with McDuff in his final days. He did admit to murdering eight persons. That included the three juveniles in 66 and five adult females uh, since his release uh, on parole but we strongly suspect there were a lot more after a final delay his execution date was set for November 17th 1998 just after 6 p.m. 52-year-old Kenneth McDuff was led into the death chamber and strapped to a gurney. Investigator John Moriarty says that's the only time he ever saw McDuff show emotion. The veins in his neck, the arteries in his neck were just pounding. I mean, just pulsating. You know, just, he was scared. I thought at some point maybe McDuff would show some remorse, but he never did. He was cold-blooded, cold-hearted, and evil to the very end. His last words were, I'm ready to be released. Release me. To the very end, he considered himself the victim. He didn't die a horrible death, no way. He died an easy death. His death was nothing compared to the death that he put all these women through, including my daughter. They died horrific 
Tess. All he did was go to sleep. The crimes of Kenneth McDuff reached far beyond the families of his victims. The public demanded that the state fix a parole system that let violent criminals like McDuff back on the streets. During the 1990s, Texas overhauled its justice system. The changes became known as the McDuff Laws. The state mandated tougher sentences and a complete retooling of parole practices. Texas also built more prisons, two billion dollars worth. The people of Texas and the legislature uh, responded by building the largest prison system, some say, in the history of the free world. They responded by um, creating an atmosphere of incredible intolerance towards criminals, especially murderers. The body of Kenneth Allen McDuff was never claimed by his family. He is buried at the prison in Huntsville. His gravestone marked only by his death row number. But Texas will never forget him. Kenneth McDuff will be remembered as the evil earthquake that shook the foundation of the prison system and the parole system to its base. And out of it, the most sweeping changes in the history of Texas have come. And how ironic that such good came from such evil. More from Crime and Punishment, same time tomorrow. Next, Roy Marsden investigates what became known as the Babes in the Wood case from over 50 years ago. Two small children went out to play and were never seen alive again.